Hey, Jeff, have you ever thought about at some point in your life what it would be like living on the other side of the world? Yes. I mean, I think generally, I don't know about every kid, but there's always this idea for, I think, children, at least here inside the United States, that at one point or another, you want to try and dig dig a hole to the other side of the world. For some reason, I don't know how this became a thing, but for some reason, that other side of the world has become China for the United States. But I don't think that's true at all, for one, because we're both in the Northern Hemisphere. Right, that would be, so that doesn't <laughs> add up, right? That would, it just simply doesn't add up. If you go straight through, you're going to end up in the Southern Hemisphere because that's that's how a ball works, which is- That's right. Yeah, the United States is basically a ball, or not, sorry, not the United States, the Earth is basically a ball. But yes, I've absolutely, I've, I've thought about this quite a lot, um, especially because I knew that we were going to, we were going to do this episode. We've sort of been planning it for at least a few weeks now. And- the idea of thinking of well, what's what's exactly opposite from where where I'm I am here in Portland, you are here in Portland. What's exactly opposite? And I think for most people, it's going to be ocean. <laughs> that's true for most people in the world. Um, that's definitely true, and there's some reasons for that, and we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to revisit what you were talking about with this digging a hole to China situation, which is an expression in the United States, and I think that they have expressions in other countries that are more akin to what is what's perceived to be the opposite of side of the world. Um, and I think it's still an expression, but I, I have some information on how this came about because I was curious too. So oh, I did a little research okay. on it, did a little digging, Very if you fun. will. And uh, the first mention of the phrase that I can track seems to come from Henry David Thoreau's Walden, which was published in 1845. So that this came from Thoreau is, was a surprise to me. I didn't I was not wow. expecting that. Uh, subsequently, the phrase turns up in at least one work of fiction uh, and a children's song. And later it appears in several Looney Tunes episodes, uh, The Simpsons and Sesame Street. So this is like, aimed towards children, this idea. I mean, what's to, to believe that you can dig to the other side of the world? What's something that you have to believe about the earth? Well, I guess you have to believe that it's round. Yeah, right? exactly. Right. It's, so that's a, part of a, what's going on. Yeah, here. it's a sphere. Um. And then I think that, uh, oh, there's also a 1997 film starring Kevin Bacon, of course, and uh, Evan Rachel Wood called Digging to China, which I don't think has much to do with that. That's just the title. I've never seen the film. So, I mean, um, still playing on the idea that you can dig to China from, right. I'm, presumably, I don't know where they were in this Kevin Bacon starred film, but it's Kevin Bacon. In so New I'm it's, or something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be in the United States somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but as you pointed out, that it doesn't really add up because first of all, um, the other side of the world from us would be in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, right. And then second, there's the practical matter of digging through the earth, right? Because the earth's core is molten metal and about 9,800 degrees, which is approximately the, uh, the temperature at the surface of the sun. The, the actual inner core is solid. Uh, it's mostly uh, metal, apparently, and 750 miles thick. So they haven't even really been able to go through the Earth's crust. So, I mean, technically speaking, of course, this isn't a thing. Um, and then embedded we in this... Even, what's that? We haven't even really been able to get to the bottom of the ocean in a lot of places. Right. So the idea so, of, like, also digging through, like... Yes, we know generally what's in sort of the molten core of the, of the, of the, of the planet. But we haven't visited it. <laughs> No, there's there's maybe going to be no visiting of that, um, yeah. other than in science fiction. Um, but there's also something embedded in, in the use of China is kind of smacks a little bit of Orientalism, um, which is the original idea of Orientalism was pioneered by scholar Edward Said in his book, Orientalism, 1978. And it's where this term that's used in academia a lot called the other comes from. And mm. so the other is that which you negatively construct as opposite you so that you define yourself as, as great or something like that. And so this or is like the normal, the standard is normal. Right. And so like, mm -hmm. this is the endeavor of particularly Europeans to, to define, you know, the near East, far East, uh, middle East as referencing Europe and as being other than what is Europe. And so there's, there's some fuzziness with that. And that's uh, something that should be pointed out. Um, but uh, there's also something that's a little unrelated to this. I've, I've never heard of this. In, in my research, I came across an earth sandwich. Have you ever heard of this? The earth sandwich? An earth sandwich. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I used to make mud pies as a kid. I don't know <laughs> if that's the same thing. <laughs> it's not exactly the same thing. So apparently an earth sandwich, and this has been done a few times, is when two people on the exact opposite sides of the globe 
put a piece of bread on either side and make an earth sandwich. Wow, it's, that's it's a lot. That's a it, wild concept that it, somebody would do that. Would do that. <laughs> well, and it takes coordination because it's the opposite, you know, time of the day, you know, night and day is, is opposite and all that kind of stuff. Um, I haven't done too much work on this, but apparently that's a thing. But when we're talking about opposite sides of the world, we're talking about antipodes. Right. That's the, that's the term. That's a geographical term for it. And so let's talk a little bit about antipodes. It's the point diametrically opposite of a particular point on Earth. So in other words, it's the furthest place on Earth from any other place on Earth. Right. So here, here I am sitting in Portland mm -hmm. at some some place, and I'm I'm sure we'll maybe we'll talk about this. I don't know. But at some point on the planet, there is a spot that is the ex the very farthest away you can possibly get from where I'm sitting right now. Right, which which is in the Indian Ocean. Which is in the Indian Ocean. Yeah. For, for us and for many people in the United States, that's where it happens to be. Um, as you mentioned, most people have antipodes in water. And that has to do with the fact that most of the Earth is water. And then also the Northern Hemisphere has a lot more land than the Southern Hemisphere. Right. So those things sort of conspire to, to make that true. About 15% of the Earth's land surface has land of it as its antipode. Um, and so land to land accounts for about 4% of the earth's surface. So there's a lot of, of our imaginations. We would end up in water if we were doing right. this. Right. Now it seems like you kind of have to win the lottery to, uh, have a land-based antipode. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you where some of those places are. And in, in just a moment, uh, the North and South poles are good examples of antipodes, right? That's sort of by definition. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I mean, that's, oh, I think even people who haven't really thought about the term antipode or even the idea of what the antipode is would immediately recognize that. Oh yeah. Okay. That's a really good example. North and South pole. They're directly opposite from each other. They're opposite each other. And um, so the antipodes, for example, of most of Africa are in the Pacific ocean. The antipodes of Australia are entirely in the North Atlantic ocean. So apparently Australia is the one continent that's completely um, antipode is completely in water. Wow, that is really interesting because it tells you how big the oceans are. <laughs> well, it, it shows how big the ocean. And you said the Atlantic Ocean, North Atlantic, yeah, North Atlantic. It's so interesting just because what are the odds? I mean, there's so there's so there's there's not that much land in the in the, the southern hemisphere as we already covered. There's a lot of land relatively in the northern hemisphere. What are the right. odds that an entire continent, you know, whatever, really large landmass that is Australia would not intersect with any other landmass in the Northern Hemisphere, even a little bit. That seems, it just, it blows my mind. It seems like that should not be the case. Well, in, in the case of New Zealand, which is not really close to Australia, but relatively close, I suppose you could say if you, a thousand miles is close, mm -hmm. um, you can, some of the antipodes uh, for New Zealand are in Spain and Portugal, but some of them are also in the Atlantic. So interesting. Huh. So it's a little different for New Zealand. Um, the let's talk a little bit about the history of this word antipode. Let's the word is derived from the ancient Greece, Greek uh, for uh, against, anti, and foot. And so loosely translated, it might be opposite foot or those with opposite feet. Uh, so in Latin, this became antipodes, which carried the meaning of those with the feet opposite. So you're just both standing on the earth and you're opposite one another. That makes sense in a certain way. Right. <laughs> you can see the uh, Latinization of it for sure. Yeah. Um, so there's also the notion of antipodes and antipodians. So antipodians are people who live on opposite sides of the earth from one another. Um, and this notion of antipodes and antipodians was helpful for promoting discussions about Earth, particularly, for example, in uh, medieval times in Europe, where the Christian church was not loving the idea. Uh, I mean, the Greeks and the Romans and probably others also, they knew that the Earth was round like this, right. this came for them. Uh, but this was not a popular idea for the medieval uh, Christian church. And, and in fact, in the eighth century, Pope Zachary decreed the notion of antipodes to be heresy. So this Why, was a, right. an idea that was called heretical. It was, um, geez, I, I'm spacing on whether this was a person, but Galileo, I believe, was imprisoned or maybe home imprisoned by the church for, for this. I think it was him or, or, or some scientist, uh, astronomer like him uh, during yeah, around this time. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this was 
not a popular opinion to voice at one point. Um, that, you know, there's antipodes, which means that the, the earth is round and there's people on the other side of the world. And um, that didn't add up for the, the worldview for, for some at the time. Uh, if we jump ahead to 1506, there's a Venetian cartographer named Giovanni Contarini. And he was the first person that is known to have mapped the land that Columbus encountered. Of course, he didn't discover it because people were already there, but he encountered this land. And so that was, showed up on this representation by, um, uh, by Contarini. And the areas that are now called the Americas on that map were called the Antipodes. Okay. So if that, na if that convention, naming convention had stuck, um, we would be, I suppose, in the United States of Antipodes. That would have been very interesting. It's a different thing, right? <laughs> Apparently, Australia and New Zealand are called the antipodes from the perspective of Britain, too, because it's a somewhat antipodal to the UK. So apparently, that's that's a term. I haven't heard that, but that's probably common in, in some places. I mean, um, it seems like New Zealand gets pretty close if its actual antipode is Portugal, you said. Right. Uh, so it's, or at least a part of it is. Like, that's... That's only a few hundred miles. It's in the neighborhood, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, on the on a global scale, I think we can probably just call it. <laughs> Not bad, right? There's going to be some of that in this episode where you know exact uh, antipodes are kind of hard to nail down, but we'll talk about approximate ones that are, you know, almost exactly, almost uh, on the other side of the earth, you know, close right. enough. Um, I, I do want to mention that the following year, 1507, German cartographer Martin Wildesmuller. Uh, chose a different name for that landmass. And he meant to apply it only to a small part of what is now Brazil. And he called it America after Amerigo Vespucci. Um, and then that convention got picked up by other cartographers. And then once uh, Mercator used it on the Mercator map, that was it was done. Like these were the Americas. Like that was the map that had all this influence. So again, that's why we have the Americas instead of the Antipodes. Um, and yeah. I mean- it's kind of hard to like rethink of America as like a different name, right? As as antipodes, but I kind of like the 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 name antipodes instead. <laughs> At least it's not named after I think somebody, which, right? And if I'm remembering correctly, I, I think Amerigo Vespucci didn't really care to to have this landmass named after him. Well, he had no idea, as a matter of fact. Yeah, he so no he idea, died but... in 1912, and it took, I guess, a several years for the maps to get from Northern Europe into the Iberian Peninsula where he was living. And uh, he he never knew apparently that this these land masses were named after him. So Why would he think about it? Yeah, <laughs> like what? Like, um, you know what? What what would he possibly think today? Right, right. It, it's one of those great thought experiments. It's like, well, if he were alive today, he'd be thinking, well, how, "How on earth did you did you come up with that name for this?" I mean, I right. a lot of land named after me. I guess that's okay, but it's not making much sense to me. Um, you know, the other thing that we're already mentioning is, you know, by using the term antipodes, we're talking about the other side of the earth, which of course the Americas aren't from the UK or from Europe, but it, it also shows that, and throughout this episode, we'll see that there's a lot of places, remote places in the world that are British and French territory, for example. Mm -hmm. And so it, it speaks once again to the extent of European imperialism and colonialism that even in a discussion like this that we're having about antipodes, those things are going to factor kind of prominently in some of our discussions. Well, uh, I think it's time for a short break already. Oh, already. All right. So we'll, we will uh, run some ads and then we will be, I guess, right back. And we're back. We're talking about geography is antipodes on the podcast this week. And I thought I'd mention some antipodes, both uh, specific and sort of in general terms, continental terms. Let's do it. Uh, that's so, what we're here for. That's right. We're, this is we, a lot of times we're like, well, this might not seem automatically geographic, but this this one is not such a case. This is clearly no. geographic. It's all geographic. So the Malay archipelago has its antipodes in the Amazon basin and adjacent areas in the Andes Mountains. So that's an interesting reference point. East China and Mongolia have its antipodes in Argentina and Chile. Okay. Oh, okay. So that's interesting because the Argentinians and Chileans, in theory, if they could, right. could actually dig a hole straight into China. Right. That would add up a little bit better there. Right? That would be <laughs> than the United States, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, Greenland's antipodes are largely in Antarctica. 
Oh, that makes sense, right? Very mm-hmm. Greenland. I think Greenland often gets conflated as being the North Pole. It's not quite. It, it's yeah, pretty far north, but it's far north, but it's certainly not the North Pole. Yeah, and la- you know, last week's episode we talked about Antarctica and how big it looks on the Mercator projection map. That's right. And it's not actually that big, but it's still a sizable continent. It's still yeah. there's still quite a bit of landmass, so it makes sense that they would cross over at least a little bit. Mm-hmm. I I did I already mentioned that New Zealand crosses over the antipodes are in the Iberian Peninsula mostly in Spain. Um, the entire oh, yeah. I'm island- actually looking at a map of it right now, and it looks yes. like it looks like a oh, what would that be? Would that be the North Island? I believe um, maybe almost it almost looks like where Wellington would be is almost exactly where Madrid would be that's, based on the map I'm looking at. It's a pretty close. It's a almost antipodal. That's yeah, right. It's very, very close. close. Yeah. Um, so New Zealand and France both have 12 antipodal countries. And part of the reason is because they own these islands that are further away from the mainland. And so that's the main reason that France has so many, because there's a number of island territories that they control in different parts of the world. Um, uh, French Polynesia, for example, and some others that we'll get to, uh, Hawaii has its antipodes in partly in Botswana. Oh, interesting. So that's one part of the United States, which, no, it's part of the United States uh, from a legality point of view. And that's where that would be. Here's something that I found interesting. Angkor Wat in Cambodia is nearly antipodal to Machu Picchu. Whoa, that is weird. Right. So you have this Hindu Buddhist temple in Cambodia being antipodal to um, this Incan city from the 1500s or, or or longer ago. Yeah, these, um, these kind of like a, two... But these two very sort of um, places from antiquity, right? That They right. feel like uh, rich with history uh, and and they're almost antipodes from one another. That is... I mean, there's like... There's all these like cosmic coincidences, right? Like this... And this is like one of them. Like why and how... And it, like it doesn't... It doesn't matter. It doesn't really do anything. Obviously, they're not having any strong impact on each other for being antipodes, but it's just weird. And it's very coincidental in the same way that, you know, how's Wellington and Madrid almost exactly, you know, the two capitals of two, two different countries, the antipodes of each other. Right. It's just weird. It's how, how does this actually happen like this? I mean, this is, I mean, this is the fun of this episode is thinking about these ways of thinking about the earth that we usually don't entertain. Right. And so right. this is a chance to entertain these ideas of, of how the earth is connected or how parts far away from each other may be similar or dissimilar in certain ways. Um, so some, some pretty, pretty close to, to antipodal situations are Christchurch in New Zealand and A Coruña, which is in Spain, which is okay. in Galicia, um, Hong Kong and La Quisa, uh, Quisa uh, Argentina, are pretty close. Um, I guess Madrid and Weber, New Zealand would be even more accurate, but you know, oh. Wellington is the bigger city. So that's near mm-hmm. antipodal, uh, Padang, uh, Indonesia and Esmeraldas, Ecuador are apparently, epi- uh, antipodes. Um, and then Ulan Ude, Russia and Puerto Natales, Chile as well. Very so we'll cool. add on, let's add on to that. Just a few large cities that are pretty close to being antipodes. A Phnom Penh in Cambodia and Lima, Peru are within 140 miles of being antipodes. Wow. That's close. Okay. That's close. I mean, again, you know, as we're talking, you know, globally, right? The, I, a, a couple hundred miles is not, that's not a lot of space. Like, let's let that go for this. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it works. <laughs> Throw our hands up. Today, and, that's yeah, close exactly. enough. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Shanghai and Buenos Aires are 240 miles away from being antipodes. Wow. Two mega Those cities. are two big cities. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we had a whole episode on mega cities, and I wish I had had that little factoid handy for that episode. Well, this is maybe a reminder for listeners to go check out that episode on absolutely uh, mega cities. Uh, Beijing and Buenos Aires are also close to antipodal, not quite as close as Shanghai and Buenos Aires, three hundred and forty miles in the case of Beijing mm-hmm. and Buenos Aires, and then Rio de Janeiro and Tokyo, within nine hundred miles, a little further. But those are big, big places in the world. Uh, and they were also hosts of the 2016 and 2020 Olympics after each other. And so that the Olympics went halfway across the world at that point. Almost all exactly. The, way, the other yeah. side of the, the other side of the world, not halfway across. <laughs> right. Yeah. They, they, they found the exact opposite point. They're like, 
That's the one. <laughs> That's the next one. <laughs> so apparently the average distance between antipodes, because the earth isn't perfectly round, it varies a little bit, uh, is about 12,420 miles. So okay. you, know, yeah. you have to go not, you know, not quite 12,500 uh, 12, miles to get to the opposite side of the earth. Uh, it is nearly impossible to travel directly from one antipode to another on a single form of transportation. I suppose if individuals had their own boats, they might be able to pull this off in certain cases where private jets that could fly really far could maybe accomplish this in cases. Um, but there are no commercially available direct flights between any of the Earth's antipodes. Yeah, I'm, tra I'm trying to think of some of, the, some of the longest flights in the world. And I don't have this information handy, but I don't think any of them go this. I don't think I don't. Well, I don't know if any of them can travel 12,000 miles without stopping. I don't. That seems like a long ways to go. <laughs> Luckily, I have some information on this. Oh, for great. So I can Perfect. satisfy your curiosity on this. So the the closest thing to an antipodal uh, connection, direct flight, is uh, flight 23 and 24 operated by Singapore Airlines, which travels nonstop between Singapore and JFK in New York. That's a long flight. That's an epic flight. It was established in November 2020. There used to be one from... Uh, Singapore to Newark, but now it's to JFK. This flight covers approximately 10,000 ground miles and the flight is almost 19 hours long. That so is you could, way too long to be on a plane. You could watch you know, the Godfather series or you could you know, pick a really long trilogy of movies to watch and you probably still have time left over to read a book or something. Um, so if you were to leave New York at 1020 on a Monday night, you would get into Singapore around 6 a.m. on Wednesday. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> you're going over the international date line. So, right? You wait. Are you? Actually, that's a good question. Are you going, if you're leaving New York, are you going like over Europe and, and Africa and India? No, I think you're probably you going, going, the the other, you're going the other way because that's yeah. that's when you cross the international date yeah, line. Yeah, because that's when you cross the international date so, line, yeah. You leave on a Monday, get there on a Wednesday. And then when you come back, you go back in time, of course. Right. Yeah, I just had a friend, she went to New Zealand and it's the same thing, right? It's it, it's weird because, and we're, we also have an episode coming up on time zones, which I think is gonna be really fun to explore. Very relevant to our conversation. Yeah. So a few weeks, a few weeks, folks. Uh, but it, it's, it's just weird because New Zealand, if you actually think about it in terms of just pure time, it's only from where we are here in, in Portland, it's only, I think, four or five hours behind us, right? So, you know, if it's 11 a.m. here, it's only like 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. Okay. there. The caveat being that it's 7 or 6 a.m. the next day. <laughs> right, right. Which is like, you know, that sort of boggles the mind a little the bit. The international date line like is that. one of those interesting things that we've made up, right? Like, right. it's not, it's people chose it, right? Yeah. And it's going to be a big topic of that episode for sure. Oh, for sure. We'll get into that. Um, so apparently some promotional and delivery flights of commercial aircraft have gone further than the flight that I just mentioned. In March 1997, there was a flight that took off from Boeing Field, which is in Seattle, and flew directly to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, a distance of almost 12,500 miles. So apparently there's at least one plane who wow. can handle it. And what I read is that both Boeing and Airbus are innovating planes that can make a distance of about that long. Um, and then apparently it refueled and headed back to Seattle. And I, I don't know if they did that. I'm not sure what the purpose of that was, but that happened. And then in 2021, a little bit more recently, a chartered flight with paying passengers operated by um, Comlux, which is a char charter flight company, which is headquartered in Zurich, Switzerland, flew from Seoul, Korea, uh, to its almost antipode Buenos Aires. And it covered just over 12,000 miles in 20 hours. That's really cool. I wonder, yeah. I would, I mean, I don't know. I'd, it seems, it seems like there might be a reason, um, an antipodal reason to do that. <laughs> like, why would you choose that, that spot? <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, it's this charter company. I mean, do they have a bunch of people who are demanding this flight? Perhaps right. it was, or, or they, people who are trying to create some kind of record or something. I don't know. It is it's interesting going there's always deeper we can go into these things. Yeah. It is interesting going back to sort of the average distance between antipodes because you'd already mentioned that, you know, we're not, the earth is not a, an actual like ball, right? right? It's not a perfectly, you know, round ball. It's, you know, it's elongated at, at the equators. 
Um, and it, it did make it did remind me of sort of that idea of like, well, what's the actual tallest mountain? One of those sort of there's sort of three candidates, you know, Mount Everest, um, uh, Mauna Kea in uh, Hawaii, and then uh, Mount Chimborazo in in Ecuador, because and that one is not, you know, physically, it's not that tall. However, it extends farthest from the Earth's core because of that that idea. Right. It's just it's because very that interesting little to think bulge. About that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. there's a bulge. Yeah. What episode was that? Do you remember? That might have been a bonus episode. I don't remember. We talked about okay. it at one point. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. We're going to repeat various nuggets because they're so nice. We'll mention them twice. <laughs> yeah. There is also, uh, I'll mention, a uh, group of islands that are uninhabited called the Antipodes Islands. Oh, and interesting. It's okay. about 530 miles southeast from New Zealand. Um, and it's recognized as territory of New Zealand and part of something called the New Zealand Outlying Islands. And of course, this was named from the perspective of Europe, I think Britain, because it's somewhat antipodal to, to Britain. Um, the islands are, in fact, more technically close to being the antipode of the town of Barfleur, Normandy in France. Uh, and of course, and vice versa. Uh, and it's also the place on land that is closest to being the antipode of London. Hence the name. So, you know, this is what it's called all over the world, even though it's not the antipode of anywhere in the world, except for apparently London. Uh, and the main island of the chain has an area of about eight square miles. It's not, so giant, not very big. Not that big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's pretty close. If it's, if it's the actual antipode within Normandy, Normandy is really just a skip away from, you know, England. <laughs> right. It's a channel swim away, or maybe yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's directly on the channel, but yeah. Very um, famous for, for its, you know, geographic position during World War II. Right? Very famous for that. Yep. Mm -hmm. I've been to the beaches of Normandy and um, this was in the early nineties and I found gun shells like washing up on the shore, like still. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. I wonder if that's yeah. still the case. I mean, that's a whole I, I'm not thing. sure. That was a little while ago, but that's something else. Yeah. Um. I want to talk about the antipodes of Portland and other places in the United States, but we need to do a quick break before we do that. All right. We will hit our final ad break right now, and then we'll come back and we'll sort of, uh, well, we'll, we'll finish up this episode. We're back. It's the geography is everything podcast. We're talking about geography is the other side of the planet or geography's antipodes. And I want to talk about the antipode of, of Portland. And I mentioned already that it's in the Indian Ocean. And that's true for a lot of places in the Western United States and Canada. Um, but there is, a, there is one place that's on land that has a human settlement there, which would be the closest human settlement to the antipodes of Portland and Seattle and Vancouver and San Francisco and places uh, much farther uh, east in the United States and Canada as well. Um, and it is a place called the uh, Ile Caruglian or the Caruglian, Caruglian Islands, uh, also known as the Desolation Islands. Interesting. Very so it is, cool. in, it is in, the, in the South Indian Ocean in subarctic waters, which means it's just outside of the Arctic Circle. And uh, the actual antipode apparently is somewhere in the area near where Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Montana border each other. Um, so again, it tells you how big the oceans are that all these cities that I mentioned have, this would be, if you want to get as far away from Portland as you wanted to, or one of these other cities, you'd have to go to the Caribbean Islands. And there is the main island there is called Grand Terre. And then the settlement there is called Porto Francais. Is this, this is a French territory. Okay, that, that was going to be my next question. Is is this an independent, you know, sovereign country or is it part of a territory of somebody else? Um, sounds like it's part of France. I'm actually looking at, again, I'm, I'm looking at an antipodal map. And if you're watching this on YouTube, this will probably be, you'll probably be seeing this map at this point anyways. And you can kind of see on this map within sort of the areas of Saskatchewan and Alberta, some like tiny little um, green islands, how they're sort of illustrating it. And... That's basically it and for basically almost all of Canada, aside from the very north and the United States, aside from, I guess, Hawaii, right? Very mm -hmm. interesting. It looks like, aside from the, those islands, 
the next closest to us here in Portland or California or what have you would be uh, Madagascar. That's right. So this this place, um, the Kruglin Islands, is the close. The next closest settlement is in Madagascar, twenty one hundred miles away. Right, um, and it not is, close. Not close. It is almost equidistant from um, uh, Australia and from Madagascar, and it's about three hundred islands um, that form an archipelago. And it was uh, it's an un, it was uninhabited when some French sailors led by navigator Yves Joseph de Carouglion, Tremarc, Tremarc, you know, so his name he's he's got his name on there. Uh, he came across and he claimed it for France, although France didn't really do much with it for a while. Um, so again, this was uninhabited. There had been nobody living there. Uh, and then the following decades, well, actually two years later after that, um, Captain Cook came by and saw it and it actually was the one who named it for the uh, for Caruglian. Apparently, this is hard to believe, but this I read this in a few different places, so maybe it's true, that when Caruglian and, and the, the French sailors were there, they put a document in a bottle and left it on a somewhere on the land saying that they claim this area for France. It seemed like a pretty specious legal way to lay claim to territory. Hmm. And then apparently Cook found the bottle. Like, what are the chances of that? I guess it's because I'm the largest island or something like that. He's like, oh, I guess somebody's already here because I've, there's this bottle here and there's a message in it saying that it belongs to France. That, um, for one, legally, I don't know how that passes. I don't know muster. how that holds up. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I mean, I guess I don't know what what cook was thinking who's by the way another person that is a frequent visitor on our podcast but i can't imagine he was like oh well i guess i guess this is francis i guess we can't do anything with bottle it. what bottle right i mean that's the other way he could have gone with it exactly i don't know what you're talking about um so the desolation islands uh are in some of the roughest waters anywhere on earth apparently so it's very choppy um, very difficult to to access. Uh, it was for for into the in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, it was an outpost for whalers and seal hunters from England, Norway, and the United States in particular. Um, and this this seal hunting continued into 1922 and whaling until the 1950s. And whale and fur seal populations were absolutely decimated, driven almost to the point of extinction in the waters around the islands. So uh, that was that was what it was used as an outpost for those activities uh, for a long time. Kind of not surprising. I mean, just knowing sort of what humans generally have done in the past, right? For us here in the United States, the, you know, the American bison, the buffalo would be the most, you know, prominent example of that but obviously you know fur seal or uh seal fur and sort of skins and everything very valuable and you know there's yeah, plenty there's of them the, they're gonna the hunt blubber them. for oil and all this mm -hmm. and this was all rendered on the island i suppose and um this was a big economic activity which eventually was curtailed and so apparently some of those populations of those animals have rebounded to some degree um, today, it is still French territory, 8,000 miles away from Paris, um, but there's no airstrip on the island. So it's only accessible by boat. And as I mentioned, the waters are can be extremely rough. Um, and so there is a supply ship called the Marianne du Friends that, reads, that leaves from uh, Reunion Island, which is off the coast of Madagascar, which is also French territory, and is the supply ship that goes four times a year to, to the Kruglians to Porto Francais to bring supplies for the people who who uh, live there, and they're not permanent residents, but they're mostly researchers. There's a few French sold uh, French soldiers there, but there are researchers who are involved in all kinds of uh, inquiry, uh, including um, looking at seismology, geology, uh, biology, oceanography, climate scientists, and planetary physics. So all this kind of work is done there, and there are in the winter about 40 people there. And in the summer, about 120 people there. And once you get dropped off, you're there That's for it. at least three months because there's no other way to get around. Um, and so this is almost as, I mean, there's, I'll, I'm going to get into some other examples of places that are extremely remote, but this is one of the most remote places 
uh, in the world. And so that's that's a commitment. And, and apparently there are a limited number of tourists who actually go and visit this and a few other islands that are part of the French overseas territories. Um, but it's not cheap. Like it costs a lot of money to go uh, to Porto Francais as a tourist. And you're only staying there for a few days. Yeah. But there's been researchers that have been there for a year plus and mm -hmm. have returned. Um, but it's, you know, and I saw a few videos where they interviewed some of the people who, who live there. And they say that it's what's striking about it is that, you know, there's a bunch of buildings there, but that's it. Like there's no sign of humanity anywhere else. Like most other places in the world, you look up overhead and maybe a plane's flying overhead, mm -hmm. not here. Right. And there is just the feeling of being in the natural world, uh, according to some of these scientists that, that they've never felt anywhere else before. It makes me think of, there's another island, this is sort of a little beside the point, but just sort of illustrating the isolation of it. There's another island that's off the, sort of in the South Atlantic Ocean, maybe about a thousand to 1500 miles off the um, Southwest coast of South Africa, that I believe is like a little research, has like a little, I think bird research, uh, sort of something tied to some university in, in England, uh, UK, somewhere. And I read an article and I think the BBC about it and just, again, talking about the isolation and sort of nobody just goes there by accident, right? There's a very intentional effort. And if you go there, you are, you're there for, for a minute, right? It's not, right. Yeah. there's no like flying in and you're done with your three day vacation, fly you're back to South gonna Africa. Tom Hanks your way off of this Island, you know, it's not. <laughs> gonna yeah. No, it's, and so it's only by boat, right? You have to, you have to sail there and you get off the boat and then, you know, when it's time to leave, you take another, you know, four week journey back to South Africa or something like that. Well, in the history of the Karuglian Islands, there is actually, there were three people who were shipwrecked on one side of the main island and they traversed the other side and, you know, made some cabins and they waited for, I think, close to two and a half years before they were able to flag down a ship somehow wow. or a ship visited there and they were able to return to other parts of civilization. Um, wow, they Tom yeah. it. Yeah, so they 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 had to make do. Um, and, and that's that's another classic thing that people think about the desert island situation, you know, mm -hmm. which which record you would bring because, you know, it, it's bound to have a, a record player there and some speakers. Right. Um, <laughs> Electricity. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's it's this idea of what if you were just away from everybody alone on an island or with a few people. Um, and so antipodes kind of make us think about that that situation as well. Uh, incidentally, the, the Grand Terre Island is about half a Connecticut. So he's keeping with uh -huh. our measures of Connecticut. If that there helps anybody. Um, what else can I say about it? Uh, now, there is uh, a bunch of dormitories there. Nice. There's a bunch of buildings that are used for scientific research. And apparently, port au prince also has a library, a gym, a cafeteria, a pub, a hospital, and a chapel. I mean, all I would really need is the pub. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it actually makes me think like, okay, there's a- I wonder where I should go out tonight, you know? Where all should right. we go tonight? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> let's go to the pub. Uh, it makes me think like there's a pub, which means there has to be some sort of regular delivery of goods, right? And I'm assuming the pub is not just beer. It's probably some that, some other stuff too. And it uh, just makes me think like, okay, who's supplying this at regular intervals and from yeah, where? And <laughs> right. Well, I mean, this is this is coming from the Marion de Friends. It's the only way that anything is brought onto the island four times a year. So they got to be thinking, here's your three month supply of everything. Right? right. I mean, there's some stuff, there's some food. Apparently, I don't know if they still have greenhouses. They may have had greenhouses at one point where they're growing some fresh because fresh produce is pretty hard to come by there. Although apparently there is a variety of edible um, cabbage there, which is okay. rich in vitamin C, which apparently was used to, uh, you know, stave off scurvy for people who were, were passing through the area, you know, for the, the whalers and the, the sealers. Um, but there's some invasive species. There's a lot of uh, elephant seals and penguins there, like a lot, right? but there's also some invasive species there, um, including some mammals, rabbits, reindeer, and cats, and also sheep. There could only be, if there's humans there, they probably brought something with them. They brought some stuff there. Uh, I think the sheep were brought there intentionally and the reindeer. The rabbits, the story I, I read about was that some scientists in 1874 
uh, went to these islands because it was an auspicious place to view Venus pass in front of the sun. And they brought five rabbits with them just in case they needed that rabbits for food. But those scientists left and left the rabbits behind. And those five rabbits have become an island of rabbits, apparently now. <laughs> and with probably no natural predators. No natural predators, except maybe the cats that showed up at some point and they, you know, the, the shats, the cats were from ships, uh, ship captains or, mm -hmm. um, you know, this kind of thing. They were either released or just walked off the ship. As, um, cat, or as cats are wont to do. You know? <laughs> right. They're like, they wander. And uh, so apparently this has had a pretty deleterious impact on the ecosystem there, particularly the rabbits, apparently who have eaten a lot of the native uh, species of things uh, of plants um, so th this, this is an issue. Um, then the other thing is that, um, uh, there are dandelions there apparently now. I mean, that so like the weed, the little, like thing yeah. below the dandelion yeah. things and it yeah. creates like a million more dandelions. <laughs> right. Exactly. So if you've seen dandelions in operation, you know how quickly they spread. And apparently they've got those, which is also muscling on some of the turf for some of the native plants there. Folks, we have an entire episode about invasive species that you should That's absolutely true. listen to because kind of what we're talking about now, but we're talking about it sort of on a global scale. And it's just, it's fascinating how things have spread around. And we even talk about sort of, you know, what is an invasive species even? Go listen to we, it. Well, we also have an episode on cats. Uh, we have an episode on cats. You can cat. check that one out. But it's it's amazing to me that you can go to one of the most isolated places on the planet and there's feral cats just hanging out <laughs> somehow not surprising maybe it's it's, it, it, it's not very surprising to be honest let's do this let's let's consider some of the other most remote places on earth and i've used islands here in this case i mean there's some very remote places on earth that are not you know they're on continents but we're talking about islands here and so let's just talk about some of these uh as we wrap things up um there's a place called a spitzbergen uh, spitzbergen Spitsbergen. Now, this is Svalbard is the name that's generally used for this place. Now, Spitsbergen is the largest island. It's north of Norway and about 516 miles from the east coast of Greenland. Uh, it's approaching the North Pole. It's very cold and it's in the territory of Norway. Um, I've but heard that Svalbard yes. is a place that if anybody wanted to move there, they're allowed to. Like they're, you're allowed to move there and have and work there and do whatever you, you want because they constantly want people to, to go there. But that does not apply to Norway itself. So if you want, if you want to go to Svalbard, you can, right. You can't get into Norway from there. <laughs> right. And, I th and there's, there is actually a airport on this particular Island of Spitsbergen so that you could fly there, which you can't do a lot of these other remote places. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you, you'd have to have permission to get probably into Norway first before right. you got there. So that mm -hmm. would be part of the issue. But yeah, there's apparently it's a very odd territorial arrangement where you're just allowed to be, if you can get there, you can be there, which, <laughs> yeah. you know, used to be the planet, but now it doesn't work like that. And we did right. an episode on international borders way back when too. Exactly. Yep. One of the things that's distinctive about uh, uh, Svalbard and, and Spitsbergen is that is the home of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Have you heard of this? I have. For some reason, I thought it was like in, you know, very far north Sweden or maybe even Norway. But I guess I guess it's actually on Svalbard, which, which maybe makes a little bit more sense. It's very cold. It's technically in Norway. And that's exactly right. They have this this vault that's made out, I think, of concrete. And if they can't control it any other way, they need the temperature to preserve these seeds to be negative 18 degrees Celsius. And so they've got this there. And the idea is that these were seeds where seeds can be kept. That's not the only seed bank in the world, but I think it's the largest one, the seed vault, mm -hmm. not a seed bank. Uh, and, you know, if we need to repopulate different plants throughout the world, that this is a place where they're stored. There are apparently about 102 million seeds from plants across the world there. Wow. Uh, they have the capacity to hold 4.5 million seeds. And it's not like they just have two of every plant. I think they have like a larger handful than that, you know. They're not knowing it. It's not. They're not doing the arc situation, although it kind of functions like that. Uh, and the antipode of Spitsbergen is just off the coast of Antarctica, southwest of the southern tip of Chile. So that's, okay. that's the antipode of this remote area. Uh, let's talk about a few more. There's um, Pitcairn Island. 
uh, Pitcairn Island, which is a British overseas territory in the South Pacific. Uh, it is where the mutineers of the HMS Bounty settled in 1790. So if you've heard of the mutiny on the Bounty, this is where those folks ended up. Apparently, there are a small number of approximately 50 residents there. So it's not just a, you know, people in the research stations, people who have settled there permanently. There's no airfield. There's no proper harbor. Um, and the antipode is in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, close to but not on the Persian Gulf. Whenever I hear about like, because these are not scientists, I've actually, I, I, I've i done a little bit of research on the Pitcairn Islands for an old episode I did for my YouTube channel. They're not scientists. They're just 50 residents. Uh, I think mm -hmm. they're technically part of, uh, of the UK because right. it's a British overseas territory. Whenever I hear about a place like this, it just, it makes me think, you know, what, why are you there? Like, what's the, what's the draw? I mean, aside from maybe that you were just from there and you, you're there, but it seems so small, so closed in, you're just not connected to anything. And I guess maybe that is the draw for some people, but it just seems wild to me. It seems very, uh, isolating it's well it's a very different way to to exist right with a very limited number of people hope you get along you know and yeah. because there's no escaping those folks um <laughs> how let's talk about another oh so i'm sorry uh there's a Tr tristan de cunha which is right. also another british overseas territory it is located between the south atlantic current and the Atlant antarctic circumpolar current it is only reachable by a ship that leaves from Cape Town. And the antipode is in the Pacific Ocean, a bit far east of Japan. This might be the island I was talking about earlier. <laughs> okay, that, that could be it. I mean, I think sometimes there's, like with everything that we list, the most this, the most that, there's different ways of configuring things mm -hmm. and understanding things. But these are some of the places that are often referred to as the most remote places on the planet. Another is Easter Island, also known as Rapa Nui, which is a territory of Chile and located about 2,300 miles from Santiago. Right. It's, it's far into the Pacific ocean. It's far in the Pacific it, ocean. It's pretty it, it, It's a 63 square mile Island that is probably best known for the Moai, which are these enormous stone statues, most, but not all of which look out into the ocean. Right. And if I recall correctly, it's pretty far out into the Pacific Ocean, and it's not even that close to any of the other sort of island chains that are sort of no, more it, commonly found in sort of the Polynesian area of yeah, the South Pacific. That's exactly right. So sort of like the Desolation Islands, this place is far away from just about anywhere. Um, and the antipode of Easter Island is in the western part of Rajasthan, India, relatively close to the border with Pakistan. Oh, interesting. Okay. I mean, Easter Island has always sort of fascinated me. I feel like it's an episode maybe sometime. I think there's probably a lot. I mean, there's a lot more to say about all these places, but that's a place um, I'd like to understand a little bit better maybe. So maybe we're going to come back to that at some point. Fascinating. Yeah. Historically, very fascinating and just geographically also just very interesting. Right. So, well, we'll make it happen. All right. So South Georgia Island um, is part of British overseas territory. I mean, this is where the expression, the sun never sets on the British empire because the islands and territories all over the place. Um, and it is a part of the South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands territory. It is about 900 miles east of the Falkland Islands, if you're from the UK, or the Malvinas, if you're from Argentina. Uh, and it hosts a small number of people associated with the British Antarctic Survey. Um, and... Very interesting note here that Ernest Shackleton, uh, you may recall, is an explorer of Antarctica, is buried there. Oh, interesting. Because that's where it all ended for him. Yeah. Huh. Fascinating. I did not know that. The antipode of South Georgia Island is in the Sea of Otosk off the north coast of Sakhalin, a Russian island that's north of Japan. All right. I got yep. a couple more for you. All right. All right. Let's do it. Diego Garcia a coral atoll in the central part of the Indian Ocean. Uh, today, there is an air and naval support base for the U.S. British, U.S. and British militaries there. Um, and there's a nefarious story that goes with this. In 1971, more than 1,000 people that are native to the area were relocated to Mauritius and the Seychelles. Uh, and the islanders and the descendants of Diego Garcia are campaigning for the right to return to their home, to their island, um, and the antipode of this particular place is in the West, uh, the Pacific Ocean, West of Mexico and Guatemala. 
So this is a place where there were people uh, mm-hmm. that were displaced. Probably for the U.S. and British military bases. For the military. Yeah. That's right. That actually, you know, you, you just mentioned that the sun never sets on the British Empire. And it's like, well, sun, sun probably never sets on the U.S. military anymore either. No, that's probably not. That's probably an accurate statement, I think. Yeah. All right. So there's one other place I want to mention. We've mentioned it on another episode before, and it's not a point on land. This is Point Nemo. Could, we could only ever talk about Point Nemo at the end of this episode. <laughs> So when this came up in which episode of our space? Uh, yeah, the, so we had a, a two-parter episode on the space race, and I can't remember which one it was. I think it was actually the, the second part when we were talking sort of, about, sort of about the modern space race. And if I remember correctly, Hunter, this is the point of the planet where you need to take down a satellite, you know, reorbit it or re, re That's right. land it. And they send it right down into Point Nemo. <laughs> That's right. And the reason is, is because it's over a thousand miles in any direction from any settle, any human settlement. Um, and in Latin, Nemo means no one. Uh, and this is named after a character from Jules Verne's 20 Leagues Under the Sea, who's the submarine captain. So that's where the name comes from. And as you said, this is where they crash satellites and the Mir, for example, the Russian space station was crashed into there. And when it comes time to decommission the International Space Station, this is where they they plan on, on putting it. This is where they're going to have it crash into the Earth. Uh, apparently, there's very little aquatic life there either because the conditions just aren't right for uh, even you know, small life, which would support larger mm-hmm. life. Um, so and <laughs> so wait for that with the International Space Station. The antipode of Point Nemo. Oh, the other one more thing I want to say before that is, and we said this in the other episode, that the humans that ever get closest to Point Nemo, and no human may have ever traversed it in a in a boat or a ship or anything like that, are the uh, are the astronauts in the International Space Station? They when they fly over Point Nemo, they're the closest people to that area. Really, I think we did talk about that. And yeah. it's still, it's kind of mind blowing that you know there are thousands of miles up <laughs> or hundreds of miles up. I guess they're sort of orbiting the planet, and they're, they're the still closest. the closest. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, the the antipode of Point Nemo is a somewhat somewhat remote desert area in western Kazakhstan. Oh, interesting. No, yeah. that's kind of that's kind of interesting because, you know, I guess if in theory, if they had to, they could also just send their satellites down there and it'd probably be okay. <laughs> it's very. It's no, a, I it's think a that there's people, this settlement's a little closer in that place. It's not quite as remote. Yeah, um, and you know, the Kazakh government and people might say, "Why are you crashing stuff on our? Why it's got to be here?" <laughs> Good point. <laughs> point Nemo. Kazakhs probably uh, would not be super thrilled about it. <laughs> This, I think, is what we have to say today about antipodes. I'll mention one more thing, which is that if you're a geographer, an academic geographer, you may be familiar with an academic journal called Antipode, a radical journal of geography. It's been published since 1969, um, and it publishes, according to their website, innovative papers that push the boundaries of radical geographical thinking. And so the use of antipode here is the opposite of conventional wisdom or the status quo. Um, This is a journal that exists to critique standard orthodoxies about things. And so that's a very clever thing that some geographers did. We'll, We'll take this name and we'll use it for this radical journal that's trying to come up with new ideas. Love it. I think everybody should go check it out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> all right hunter uh, i think we're about wrapping up with this episode if you want to do your whatnots thanks jeff i'm hunter Shoby. i'm a professor of geography at portland state university i'm co-author of upper left cities and portlandists which are both cultural atlases that were co-authored with david bannis and i am co-host of this podcast geography is everything all right. And my name is Jeff Gibson, also co-host of this podcast, Geography is Everything. You can also find me over on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash little last sign geography by Jeff. Do more geography videos, typically shorter than our podcast. Go check it out. If you liked what you listened to today um, and you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. This, that helps us um, sort of get pushed to more people. Uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, what have you, please rate and review us. Always love seeing those. Uh, people are very highly complimentary. So it's kind of cool to sort of see those come in. Um, let's see, what are we doing next week, Hunter? We are doing... Like, oh, I think I know, but maybe you should confirm. For oh, me. It's, it looks like it's World Fairs. World Fairs. World yeah. Fairs. So this is a really fun one because it's not something that we really do anymore as a, as a global society. But at one point... World fairs seem to pop up, particularly in the United States, but I think in other places too. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and 
usually in some of the wealthiest parts of the world, but not only exclusively, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, you, to be able to pull off something like this, you would have to have a fair amount of affluence to do that. But yeah, we'll talk about world fairs and why they exist and where some of them were. Um, so get, get ready for geography is world fairs. Should be a really fun episode. Maybe, maybe this will spark a, a conversation about bringing one back. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, so I guess with that, um, well, our episode's about done. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, listeners. <laughs>